name is Jay. Your name is Brad. Brad. Mm -hmm. Your name is Michelle. Michelle. Nice Good to meet you. you. We're up here on uh, Mount Helix today, and we're out asking the big question of people: What do you guys think happens after you die? Your eyes go closed, and what happens next? Something or nothing? Go for it, Brad. Um, I don't know. I I don't think about it too often. You know what I mean? But I think um, if I were to guess, I would say like. After you like close your eyes or whatever, then you 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 would maybe open them again and see like a light, like a bright light. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I think I would see just like God's face. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just like the first thing. And then um, like I I believe I would be in heaven. Like, okay. Like. Okay. So, how about you? So that's the same belief? Well, I think for me personally. That, like same as Brad, I'd be going to heaven. But I believe there's two answers to that question, just depending on what you believe. I believe like we're here up here with the cross. If you uh. believe in Jesus Christ and you accepted what He did for you um, and His shed blood for you on the cross, then you will be with Jesus Christ and you'll be in heaven with God. Um, but if not, and you don't accept that free gift that He's offered you, then the Bible says, Scripture says that you will be in hell. Mm -hmm. And so I believe it's just where you've placed your faith that determines that answer. Mm -hmm. um, Brad and I, we've accepted what Jesus Christ has done for us, and so we'll be in heaven with the Lord. I truly believe that. Why are, you, why are you so assured of that? What, what do you think, what is it that kind of, what do you think that's, that's there for you? We've um, heard a lot of different thoughts on that, so. For me personally, I think, like, um, God's done so much in my life already, and I've already seen, like, and experience so much of, of his work already and, and it's just undoubtedly like God you know what I mean and and in the Bible like it's really clear what happens after we die and I, and I feel like with as as sure as I am of who God is and how he's changed my life so far like it, it can't be wrong mm -hmm. I mean everything he's said up to this point has been true so why would this be any different you know what I mean mm -hmm. So did you, did you have a particular event happen in your life that made you go this direction, or have you just always believed all your life? Um, I've always been taught by my parents in, in kind of this fashion, I guess, but I mean, I think at, at some point it's up to every person to really decide for themselves and not just what they've been told and, and really like make the decision and, and decide is this what I truly believe or is this not what I want for my life and then you just go from there you know what I mean and then and then once once you make that decision you can really start to feel God just working in your life and, and changing things and, and just it's so powerful you know mm-hmm mm-hmm and with you everything that's happened anything significant that you that really made you do an about face from where you were to where you are now I'm well, like Brad, I grew up in a Christian home too. Mm -hmm. And for me, like I grew up in the church and so it was so easily to think that like I was a Christian that I just because of my environment that I was automatically in that place of favor with God. But it wasn't until I turned sixteen that I realized that it needs to be a personal decision that I make before the Lord because our God is a personal God and He works in our lives individually. And so it wasn't until I accepted what He did for me on the cross that I was really saved. And so it's just when I truly realized the holiness of God and the sinfulness of my own state that I surrendered myself to God. And that's when I believe I became a Christian. Um, yeah, just when we accept the work that He did on the cross for us. Talk to a lot of young people. What 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 advice would you give young people um, that are kind of struggling with the, the whole idea of believing in Jesus? Um, it's you know a lot of them are uh, told so many different things nowadays. You know you think about just the the access they have nowadays versus where it was 30 years ago to what they are their minds are opened up to just you know, the internet, the, you know, just school, people they talk to, uh, different ideas. What advice would you give a young person um, to try to, to stay on the road or, or believe in that direction? Are you talking about kids who already profess to be Christian or no. just are looking No, they're looking, they're, they're wondering and they're not sure and they, they see all these, these people are telling them these different things and 
and it's all sorts of things are being thrown at them, what, what advice would you give them in order to make that decision for Jesus? Um, I, I believe first and foremost it's the work of the Holy Spirit who does that in a person's life. But I guess just encourage them. Um, it's not church that saves us by any means, but it's definitely a good place to seek out God. And, um, yeah, just, I don't know, it's such a tricky question because it's not advice that can be given, but it's a work that the Lord does in us. Mm -hmm. And so God brings us to that place each in our own lives. But um, I think it's more so just as us as Christians, not advice we should be giving, but how we should be loving people that will sh truly show them Jesus Christ. Because mm -hmm. that's what we're called to do, is show the love of God and the light of God. So it's just to show them our lives and be a testimony of the Lord and let our lives be a testimony of what it is to really um, have a relationship with Christ. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So um, a, lot, a lot of people, you know, not, not, I, I certainly don't know them inside out, but... You know, they profess to be Christians, yet they uh, go out into the world and they don't resemble a, a true Christian in, in the way they act. Um, and yet and they kind of uh, use the whole, I'm saved by Jesus, and use it as a license to do whatever they want. Um, how would you respond to that? Um... I don't know. I, w I would assume that in those situations, most of the time, it, it's um, it's just a case where, like, I mean, once you're saved, God starts to change who you are and start to purge the the impurities from from your your being, pretty much. And I think um, if you don't let God do that work, then you'll stay, um, I guess, carnal and and really worldly, and um, and and I I don't think that it by any means changes the fact that you're saved, um, but it's still it's just kind of a, a roadblock in in the work that God's doing, and I think it's not until you really start to let Him do that work before it starts to change who you are and you start to resemble Jesus Christ more and more. Mm -hmm. Good answer there. Do you think you got to be a good person in order, in order to go to heaven? No. no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's by God's grace and God's grace alone. Okay. Um, there's nothing we can do to merit our own salvation. Let me give you a, what's called the good person test. I don't know if you've ever heard it, taken it before in your lives, but uh, you know the actor Kirk Cameron? Ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. he, 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 worked, he does evangelism now all over the world, and, and this is one of the things he is involved in teaching people when they evangelize, it's kind of getting people to realize that maybe they're not such a good person after all. You ever, you ever told a lie in your life? Yeah. yeah. So have we. I bet everybody up here has, right? What does the world call people that lie? Liar. Liar. Ever stolen anything in your life, taking something without permission? Yeah. What does the world call people that uh, steal? Thief. Thieves, yeah, there you go. Ever use the Lord's name in vain, said it in a curse word? Yeah. And that's called blasphemy, right? You're taking your Creator's name and using it in a. <laughs> in a. Uh, in a you know, derogatory. Yeah, sure, sure. So. So we believe, as we're Christians, and we believe as Christians, after this life ends, we're going to come before God, Jesus, and He's going to judge us for the things that we've done in this life. So when you go before God, and you come with these things that you told me that you did wrong before Him, do you think you're going to go to heaven or hell? I think I'll go to heaven because I'm saved by Jesus' blood and not by my good works. Okay. They've been washed well, away. You guys, you guys, what church you guys go to? Um, we go to Bible College. <laughs> oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Over here? Or? Marietta. Marietta? Okay. Yeah, wow. Bible College there, so. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's nice I'm to run into to people. Jesus as <laughs> Lord is our lives as possible. <laughs> that's great. That's great. It's good to talk about a lot of different people. Well, I want to tell you uh, some testimony. Okay. You know, and then we all, you know, we should be telling people about our own uh, testimony and what God's done for us in our lives, what He's revealed to us in our lives. 
we've been Christians pretty much of our our entire lives. We've become stronger over the years, and and that's that's the way God works in us. He tries to brings trials into our lives to try to strengthen us, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we had a uh, trial occur to us on November 6th of 2007. So right after the uh, 2007 wildfires here in San Diego, fires everywhere. We lived in the East County, lived over in Hamul at the time. Um, we were evacuated from our home. About a week after the, uh, the end of the fire, um, we, I, uh, we lost an 18-year-old son in a car accident. We lost him suddenly. We didn't get to say goodbye. Just boom, just happened. Uh, he was on his way to uh, Mesa College here in San Diego when the accident occurred. It was the middle of a day, a dry road day just like this. He was flying up the 94 West Freeway here. He was driving in a car he'd been driving for one week when it happened. He's running late for a cross-country running class. He was a cross-country runner since the age of eight. He ran about 40 miles a week on average. He was dressed in his running shorts, his running shirt, and some brand new running shoes he got the night before from a shoe company that was sponsoring him to test out the shoes. He was all excited about running the first time. He hit it up the 94 West, and uh, he lost control in the fast lane. I think something failed in his car. And this is the unusual part. This is where he lost his life. This is the, there's a house on the 94 West Freeway that has a white cross on it. And it's been there for many, many years, way before my son's accident. This is my son's skid marks. They're coming across the 94 West Freeway from the fast lane to over here. They're dead center on the cross. There used to be a tree here. He hit the tree, split his car in half, ripped him out of his seatbelt, and he landed in the backyard of this house. No drugs or alcohol in his system. He was driving too fast. He landed directly positioned facing the cross on his back. Parts of his car went completely around the cross on the roof. We actually have news video coverage of the owner of the house picking up parts of his car around the cross. So that was a trial in our life. So we lost our only son. And uh, the real question is, did my son accept Jesus Christ and get his sins forgiven before his life ends? Because you got to do that before your life ends. We think he did as his parents. And we pray we'll, we'll see him someday in heaven. But uh, that happened. You know, we're all, we're all going to lose loved ones or friends or somebody eventually, right? But uh, just, I just tell you that because, you know, it's the urgency of getting that out to people and sharing your own lives. I mean, you guys <laughs> um, are really versed, I can tell, in the Bible and God's teachings. And getting that out to people that, that don't know the Lord before it's too late. You know, I, uh, but, uh, so that happened. My, uh, my son was an organ donor. He donated his body to an organization called LifeShare. That's what you see that donor symbol on your driver's license on. Well, um, an 18 year old, uh, boy that went to, uh, school up just north of here got my son's uh, ligament in his arm. He was a baseball pitcher. And at Matter Day High School up here. He actually went to school with Matt Barkley, who was now on USC as a starting quarterback. Starting quarterback. And um, he was actually scheduled to, uh, before the injury occurred, and had a really good shot at being the quarterback for that team that year. But anyway, we, we talked to him. So anyway, he uh, sent us a letter and um, thanked us for the donation. Real nice, nicely written letter. Um, in fact, this is, the, this is the article, the newspaper. 18-year-old driver killed and slammed to a tree, and that's his car. He was used to a four. He had a four-cylinder Jeep before he got that car. It was a much slower car than that. <laughs> so this uh, Matt sent us this letter. Can you read that letter real quick to everybody, all of yours? Yeah. Okay. Dear donor family, hi. My name is Blake. I'm writing to your family to express my sincere empathy in your loss of a family member. I'm deeply sorry for your family, and I am praying that God may guide you in this time. I'm also writing to your family in great respect and gratitude for your family decision to donate this special gift. 
The transplant I received and the scarring that has taken place due to the surgery will serve as a reminder of your family and especially your loved one. I'm greatly privileged and thankful for my opportunity, which I will be powered by your loved one as he or she has enabled me to be healthy again. I thought I would share with you a brief history of who I am and, that, and what the surgery has allowed for me to do. I'm an 18-year-old boy who just graduated from Matter Day High School in Santa Ana, California. I'll be attending Santa Clara University in the fall. I'm the oldest child and have one brother and two sisters. My brother is 17, my sister is 16, and my little sister is 12. Growing up a child full of energy and love for athletics, I played hockey, basketball, football, soccer, and baseball. When I got to high school, a lot of those things started to change or not go the way I had hoped for. To make a long story short, I ended up uh, lettering in football and ba uh, baseball. I had many ups and downs in football, such as losing the quarterback job to Phenom, Phenom yeah. Matt Barkley, after being the starter co starting quarterback my freshman and sophomore year for the freshman team and the sophomore junior varsity team. However, I ended up playing receiver for our varsity team my senior year and gained many life lessons along the way. In baseball, my sophomore year on varsity, I hurt my arm pitching. My junior year, I did the exact same thing. After that season, I got an MRI and found out my ulnar collateral ligament. Ulnar collateral ligament, um, also known as the Tommy John ligament, was torn. I ended up playing third base for my team my senior year, however, and we had a remarkable season that again brought many ups and downs, but many life lessons as well. I'm honored to let you know that the transplant your family member has generously donated has replaced my damaged elbow ligament in my arm through surgery commonly referred to as Tommy John surgery. I'm currently still in stitches and in a brace and I've started my rehabilitation process that will take approximately one year. I have hopes to play baseball and uh, pitch at Santa Clara University. Um, I will redshirt my first year due to my injury and rehabilitation, but will then resume my baseball activity my second year there. I am again very grateful for your family and hope to fulfill my dreams of pitching out of respect for your loved one. I will never forget your family and your loved one as he or she is in a better place. I hope to keep in contact with your family and cannot be thankful enough for what his surgery will, uh, is going to enable me to do. Thank you again and may God bless your family. You're in my prayers and in my heart. Thank you. With sincere gratitude, Blake. So he left his phone number there at the bottom and um, so my wife got on her cell phone after reading it and called him and we didn't get him on the phone. Uh, we got his voicemail. So my wife left him a voicemail and uh, we didn't hear anything back from him for quite a long time. We thought, ah, oh, he's 18, he must be involved in some other things. And so we kind of didn't think much after that about it. And then uh, one day we were picking our, uh, we have uh, foster youth menti mentors. We're, we're foster youth mentors. We take kids from the county out camping, bike riding, that kind of stuff. We've been doing it for many years. We were taking our now 18-year-old uh, foster youth that knew my son real well growing up. My son taught him how to ride quads and different things. They had a lot of fun together. We were taking him on a bike ride to Coronado. We were driving up the 94 West Freeway. We lived in Hamul at the time. Driving on the freeway, and we pulled, we were driving the freeway, well, we were driving past this house in the freeway. My wife's cell phone rings. Who do you think is calling us for the very first time where we're actually talking to him? Blake. Blake, right in front of this house. All three of us just looked at each other and couldn't believe he was calling us. So we, uh, we decided to have dinner with him. So we had dinner with him and his mom up at the Clay Dripper restaurant in Carlsbad. We all sat down to eat, and uh, Blake started asking questions. He goes, uh, what kind of car did Devin drive? That's my son's name. And uh, I said, it was an Acura Integra and the model and everything. And he said, uh, he looks at us funny, and he says, I drive that same car. Then, uh, then we start talking to his mom, and his mom is a CASA, which are like foster youth mentors. They take the kids from the county out and shop with them and that kind of thing. So all this stuff is hooking up. 
And uh, I, we believe that God was involved in that. God's involved in our life all the time. And he sees the conversation we're all having right now. And he wants you guys in heaven. And he wants you to tell other people about him. So they too will, will be in heaven with you also. Um, but uh, I, I don't feel it was just random that I, we met you guys up here. I think we met you up here for a reason. I think God's working all the time in our lives. But... Uh, like I said before, you guys are, um, you believe in the Lord. I don't know how much evangelism you do. Do you do much evangelism? Not much. Um, not. I mean, not, not in the sense like street evangelism, but I mean, do, do you yeah, talk to your I friends look for and opportunities stuff? Good. And, and great. I'm always open and aware of them. Hey, that's great. One, uh, one thing we tell people is this. Chris trying to get motivated more than anything, you know, I, is um, picture right now a best friend or a loved one in your family that's not saved and you know for certain that they're not saved they tell you many times and just don't believe in that stuff now picture that same family member today getting in a car accident or suddenly losing their life some other way and uh, if they didn't accept Christ at some point without you knowing where would they be? As, as Christians. If they hadn't accepted the Lord, mm-hmm. they would be in hell. Okay. Yeah, now picture that same friend or loved one in hell now calling up to you and saying, why didn't you tell me about the Lord? Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why did you keep it to yourself? It's just a kind of a symbol, kind of a, something to make you think. It's not nothing to get, put a guilt trip on you. It's something to make you think. I, I had that same thing told, told to me and it was like, you know, you got a point there. I say, you know, why am I keeping it to myself? If I say I love the Lord, if I say He means everything to me, why am I just keeping it to myself? So we try to to share that with people. Um, just kind of get them to kind of take on that. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do by any means, but um, it's what uh, He wants us to do. He wants us to go out and tell the good news. Um, to, to all, right? And uh, whether or not uh, the Lord does the work on them and, and uh, gets them to accept Him, you know, I I, uh, I don't know. You know. A lot of times we'll talk to people. We don't know where it's going to go. I mean, they may not. All we may be doing is just planting a seed, and the, and sometime in the future they may meet somebody else or have some occurrence happen in their life, and it may just make them help them make that choice. It's an eternal choice, right? Eternity is a long time. This life is just just so temporary. When you think about eternity, it's just uh, you got to get that out and get people to think like that is uh, that's what we need to be trying to do. Anyway, a couple of things I want to share with you. I share with people um, just things that, that I found interesting and just doing some some little research on the, the internet. I don't know if you guys ever heard of laminin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're that's good. You're one of the first people who have actually heard of it. Really? <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, these are for the viewers. Um, laminin is they're like little crosses that hold your cells together in your body. There's just millions of them all over your body, and it's amazing that the Lord used a cross to hold all that together. And that makes me think of Colossians 1, 15 through 17. And in that verse, it says. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He uses a cross to hold it together. So it's kind of just one of those things, you know, make you think. Yeah. And then the other thing, I don't know if you've ever seen this one. This picture here was taken by the Hubble Telescope. This is in the Whirlpool Galaxy. And it's a picture of a cross way out there. And uh, just, you know, one of God's creations, right? Yeah. Whether it has any significance, whether we know something about the future, I don't know. Yeah. But it's something to make you think. He's, he's created a lot of amazing things out there. I, so many complex things. When I run into people that don't want to believe in the Creator, I just really... One thing we tell them is, 
Oh, let's do this cross over there. Right, right in front of us right here. Somebody designed, somebody built that cross, right? And then you look at our, our bodies. We believe somebody designed, somebody created this body of ours. Very, very complicated. The blood, the nerves, your eyes, everything your eye has to work against simultaneously just be able to see. And to say there wasn't designer creator to all that, it just it just kind of <laughs> but anyway, you guys, any questions for me? No, just continue the good work that you're doing. Well, yeah. Thank you. Encourage people in the Lord and just be that testimony. Thank you. Again, it was it was refreshing to meet people, young people especially, that are in love with the Lord with you guys like you are. And I encourage you to stay strong and move ahead and let the Lord do the work in your life. He's got a lot of things He's yet to reveal to you and just stay close to him he's, he's there for you he's there for you always Amen. he's the light of this world okay all right god bless you guys you too. God bless. all right all right